good evening, everyone. Allison Scalberg here, cons um, Consolidated Planning Group and Support Group Leader for um, ADDA-SR. Uh, that is the Southern Region. Um, our group is actually, um, we meet out of Fort Bend County, and we used to meet in person, face-to-face um, -face, uh, with our, we had a parent support group and a support group for both the elementary age kids and high school. Um, but as you guys may have heard, uh, due to the pandemic, we've been, um, we moved our meetings to Zoom um, almost two years ago. It seems like a time, I don't know, I guess probably everybody's feeling that this pandemic never, uh, never, ever ends. Um, but the ADDA, or whether you call it ADA or ADDA support group, has been around since 1987. Um, we are a subchapter of the mothership out of Houston. Um, and this group was um, created, um, you know, specifically uh, to provide support um, to families and individuals impacted by ADHD. We have a number of families that um, attend our meetings, and there may be comorbid diagnoses or, or what have you. Um, but each month, we typically meet the last Tuesday of, of most months. The ex exception is maybe the week of Thanksgiving, maybe the week of Christmas. Um, and um, each month, we have a new speaker uh, that talks about a variety of different topics that impact us as parents um, with children with um, ADHD or other related conditions. So tonight, um, you are in, we cannot see you or hear you. We know you're there. We know you're out there, but, um, but your cameras and your microphones are muted. So if you've got any background stuff going on, don't worry about that. Um, tonight, um, we are, our topic tonight is, 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 is a parenting topic, and we're excited uh, to have Jeremy Angus uh, back with us as a speaker. He's a great speaker and has done a great job in the past, and he always has some good, um, some good insights and some good, I would call them strategies. And um, I, you know, I am a parent. I'm a parent of uh, to four, and I have two kids with special needs, one uh, with ADHD. So we've kind of gone through all of these things. My kids are getting um, older, and uh, the truth is, is a lot of times uh, life is tough at our house. And, um, and so we need all the tips that we can get and complicated by the pandemic and other things that have been going on. So um, nevertheless, we're really, really glad um, that you're here, that you've joined us this evening. We will be ending at, um, on or before 730. So if you're planning uh, your evening, you can plan on that. Um, and we welcome your questions. And so if you have questions tonight as we're going through the presentation, I'm going to be monitoring the chat box um, for Jeremy and kind of reviewing any questions that come up. Um, so don't be shy. Put your questions out there and we'll answer just as many as we can. So having said that, um, Jeremy, I would love to just turn it over to you. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Allison. I appreciate that. Well, thank you guys all for coming here today. Um, uh, the presentation today will be on what's called present focused parenting. I've been working with uh, several mental health groups and parental, being present focused has been a big issue for nowadays. Uh, a lot of people have been drifting between the past and the future a lot, and it causes a lot of stress and anxiety. And we'll kind of go through what that means and, and, and some of the issues that happen there. But <clears throat> it's important as we're going through this to remember that learning takes place in the present moment. And most children experience life in the present moment. And that's one of the things that we see why it's so difficult for parents and for a, a ch their children to really see eye to eye, because most of the time as adults, we've been taught to kind of drift between different perceived realities of what's happened and what is going to happen. <clears throat> so as I said here, it's kind of tough to parent when you're a time traveler. And that's kind of the theme that I've been using to kind of pull the analogy to people is that our brain has these two functions that we use a lot. One of them is memory and one of them is anticipation. So the, the biggest issue there is that we tend to use those skills. They're great skills. They, they're, they're built to help us survive in nature. And memory is really what's made us separate from, you know, everything else on earth. And there's no other creatures that we know of who retain long-term memory and can pass it on to one another. So it lets us get a jump start on the next group of people. Every generation gets to use what we remember from the previous generation to improve our society and to add to our lives and to in increase things. And we can also use anticipation 
to make assumptions about what tomorrow might bring. And of course, with the you know things happening in in the current world, sometimes those things do pop up on us, and that causes a lot of anxiety. But we'll kind of go through each one of these skills in, in detail. So with memory, one of the things that's important to memory is that it's what our brain uses to learn. It's it's memory lets us remember the things that have happened in the past, sort them. That way we don't have to do it again. And we review what has happened in order to kind of predict what we're going to do next. It's, it's a very simple process. I mean, it, memory is not simple, but for the most part, it's good to think of it like that, especially with this analogy, is that we look back on our past experiences when we're dealing with new experiences. And sometimes that skill set can kind of go awry. And a lot of and most of our identity is based off our memory, stories that we tell ourselves, events that we've had happen, career paths that we've changed, different experiences that we've had accumulate to who we think we are, or who we tell other people we are. And a lot of time when we meet new people or, you know, when we're out in the world, especially with things like Facebook or, and Instagram, we, we want to tell our memories. We want everybody to see our memories because that's what we think reflects who we are as a person. Now, anticipation is what we use, learn to adapt. Again, memory is what we use to learn, and anticipation is how we adapt. If we can anticipate a situation that's coming up, we can prepare for it. If we know that we're going to need to, it's going to be cold tomorrow, then we know we need to get our jacket ready. If we know that we're, we have to switch jobs or, or there's a, something, we can start looking for another job. And so anticipation is very important in that it allows us to prepare as things are coming at us. But also anticipation can be seen as excitement when we think the outcome is going to be good, but it's also seen as anxiety if we think the outcome is bad. What's funny is in research is that there's no distinct, there's no biological difference between anxiety and excitement. Technically, they're the same emotion. So that's something important to think about for us when we act anxious and our kids don't understand that we're anxious, it could be that they think we're excited because they understand excitement. Excitement's really important to kids. They, they get so excited about things like Christmas or their birthdays or school being out for the summer or new movies coming out. And us as adults, because we've been taught how to see things in kind of a negative light, there's a really good chance that our anxiety could be translated as excitement for them. So what happens if we use memory and and anticipation incorrectly. Well, memory being used incorrectly becomes depression because what it is is that we get stuck on the past. We get stuck in that mode of believing that we could have done something different, that we should have done something different, that our life hasn't been as exciting as other people's or there's that we've missed opportunities and missed, you know, uh, chances to flourish or any whatever it is that you go back in the past and judge. And, and that's a big theme right here, too, is the judgment part. When there's all these different things that we were taught, these are all skills that we've developed over time. But it's recently with the advent of social media, the concept of really building yourself up and, and everybody believes that, that you're supposed to be the best person ever. And, you know, you're not supposed to have any problems. and You're always supposed to think positively that's a lot of pressure because there's not very many people that can pull that off. I, I know that I deal that with myself. These depression, anxiety are one of those things that we catch ourselves shifting between all the time. But children have not really unlocked the skill of really depression yet. Now, kids can show depression. It's not in every typical kid. They, they can get stuck in that emotional state. And you got to remember too, though, their connection to the past is much closer. You know, something that happened two years ago, that's a big chunk of their lives. Whereas if you're in your 40s, two years ago doesn't seem as as far away. It seems like or it, it's just a little portion of who we are. But we have such a massive amount of experience at that point. You got to remember that, that with the older you get, the more likelihood of depression there is because there's so many more experiences. And Every time you go back and visit a memory, you go again with your time traveling, you hop in your time machine, you go back to look at this situation, this, this current state of mind you're in will alter that memory. 
So if you go back and think of something bad that happened, but you think of it as a positive light, like, well, yeah, you know, that was really hard when I lost my job, but look of where I'm at now. I, I, I love what I do now. I'm, 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 at the time, it seems so awful, but now it's better. Every time you think about that situation where you lost your job, it becomes more positive. It's a weird situation because you're looking at it with your current lens, um, the, you know, the lens in which you see the world alters the things that have happened in the past. And so with kids, because it's so close, they don't mess with it as much. But as they get older, the farther back you have to go in memory, the less you really remember about it. So you add to those memories as you go. So those situations seem much and much worse than they have if every time you go back to them, you go back to them with a, with a sad state. And then again, with anticipation, if you utilize anticipation incorrectly, it gives you anxiety. So anxiety is when we get stuck in the future. And it's funny because a lot of the research that's coming out about anxiety and depression is that it's not necessarily the depression anxiety that gets us. It's the negative stimulus, or I'm sorry, the negative stigma that comes with it. It's one of those things where if you think of yourself like a tuning fork, right? Uh, I heard this from a uh, somebody who, who I, I was talking to somebody that was a, a monk and, and it was asking them about, they always talk about wanting to be centered, what it means to be a centered human being. And he said that human beings are like tuning forks and they tend to back, bounce back and forth between the future and the past. Being centered means to slow down and put yourself in the current moment, which is really the only time that you have to make any alterations. Because if you travel in the past, you can't deal with stuff in the present. And if you alter things in the past or in the future, you, they could have dire consequences. Like we've learned from every movie we've ever seen with time travel. If you mess with the past, you could make mess with the future in a way that you didn't anticipate. Again, with the anticipation. So it's important to think about with anxiety, we can, we can imagine, we can use anticipation to imagine the future. We can sit there and go, okay, well, maybe this could happen. Maybe this could happen. Maybe this could happen. And again, if judgment doesn't come into there, just like when you're looking in the past, if you don't bring judgment in, there's nothing wrong with it. But when judgment comes in, now we're experiencing those things. So not only are we seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of possibilities when only one of them can happen. You know, we, we, we think about 10 or 15 different things that can happen. Only one of them can happen. But anxiety is when we allow ourselves to experience the threat of all of them. And the problem with the brain, the way it's set up is it can't tell the difference. It does not know the difference between a perceived threat and a real threat. And we're learning that through research now is that if I think of something bad's going to happen, my body reacts the same way. I get, my palms get sweaty. I, my, my, I get shallow breathing. My heart starts to race. I start to get scared because my brain believes that whatever I'm thinking about is happening right now. So that's really important to think about when you're dealing with stuff with your kids. And children haven't really unlocked the skill of anxiety yet. They, they can show anxiety, but it's not quite at the level that adults have, again, because we have more experiences. So what does it mean to have a full mind versus being mindful? And this is something that takes a lot of understanding and training to really get to, but it makes such a huge difference. Because if you attune to the present moment and you intentionally and understandingly, uh, I'm sorry, it, um, the intentionality and its understanding of behavior, the, the idea here is that you have to think about what's happening in this situation with your kid. And I didn't do this when my kids were younger. I learned this skill set when they were probably closer to 10, 10, 11. But I wish I had known it sooner because one of the things that I noticed about myself is that I was giving in to the anticipation. Um, I knew other parents that would give in to the memory. They would be like, oh, well, that's just the way he does things. You know, he did that when he was two and he's going to do it again when he, you know, and now he's four. Now he's doing it again. He should know better. He should have learned by now. And so that they're looking at past behaviors to try to understand current ones. My issue as a parent was that I was looking at the future. I would see, you know, a nine-year-old spill a glass of milk and part of my brain would be like, wow, what, what are they doing? They need to learn. They, they can't be spilling milk. Like, 
I can't let them grow up and, and, and become a milk spiller. That'd be so embarrassing. Like they need to learn these things. And that's, that's one of the hard parts with parents, uh, with kids with special needs is that we believe if we don't tackle the behavior right now and, 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 and squash it, then by the time they're 20, they're going to keep repeating it. And I totally understand that fear because one of the biggest things, you know, as a, as a, a child who grew up as a special needs child, it's very important for parents that their child lives a normal life. And you hear that all the time, especially with kids with ADHD or hyperactivity or autism, is that they want their kids to be as normal as possible. And I used to work at a pre-K center, <coughs> excuse me, and I would talk to parents all the time about this because I was the first person that would tell them that their child had special needs. I was the one who dropped the bomb sort of. And I would talk to them about this and I'd have to reassure them that there is no such thing as a normal life. Again, where does our concept of a normal life come from? Why, why do people think that life in the 50s was better than life today? And a lot of it comes from movies, TVs, books that we've read from our memory thinking, oh, well, that's what a normal life is. A normal high school experience is that movie I saw, you know, the breakfast club, that's what a normal high school experience is. But then you remember, because we don't remember quite remember our actual experience because we've added things to it. Every time we've time traveled back to our past, we've added things. And sometimes we cut things out. So maybe we're going to cut out the thing that doesn't really back up what we believe, because there's a really simple exercise you can do to understand what it means to have a view or a lens of the world. It's known as a schema is that you just look around your room and you look for everything brown. And if you don't, you, you count everything in your room that's brown. And then you close your eyes and try to remember everything in the room that's green. And the, the brain can't do that because it was looking for brown. So if you go sifting through the past and trying to find evidence for things for the present, you'll find it. But also the more you do that, the more you'll sift out things that aren't relevant to what you believe. So what does that mean for raising kids? What it means is that you really got to try to see them who they are right now. Not who they were, not who they will be, but who they are right now. And one of the biggest mistakes that we make is that we try to explain to them who they should be. And in one of the presentations I give talking about human communication, just to sum that up really fast, it is a massively complex process because you're taking thoughts, which we don't completely understand. We know they're little electrical impulses. So you're taking little electrical signals in your brain and then you're coordinating hundreds of muscles in your throat and in your mouth and in your tongue. And it's what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm thinking as the thoughts come up and I've planned this before, so it's, it's a little easier because I've put it in a, and I've got the PowerPoint to help me. But for the most part, I'm trying to put these little sound bursts that get, go out into the air and, and, sh and shake the air in the, in, in the environment, which causes the hairs in your ears to bend. When those hairs bend, they send a signal to your brain saying, hey, I bent 45 degrees to the left and down a little bit. That must be an S sound. So then your brain sits there and goes, okay, that's what this sound is, that's this sound, and it starts putting it all together and putting it into sentences. And then it has to run it through memory and make meaning out of it all. You have to, how do I know what the word, uh, you know, couch means? Oh, because I've seen a couch before. And your brain sees a couch and it goes, okay, that's what he's talking about, it must be this couch. But if I said just couch, I was like, oh, I meant an L-shaped couch and you meant a, 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 a a sectional couch that's a, that's a, a u-shape so we're not communicating right because i didn't give them information so when we're talking to kids we have to remember their little brains are trying their best they don't have as much experience they don't have as much of uh, practice as us so when we're just sitting there talking to them and just giving them information 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 they're only going to take little tidbits of a, of it and they're only going to take tid, little tidbits based off their current understanding of the world so if you give them 100 words, they're probably going to form their understanding out of maybe 12 of them, if they're lucky. 
because the human brain can only really hold between about five to nine things in short-term memory. So if you don't give them a break, that's an issue. So we'll go through, we're going to go through a few strategies you can learn to kind of understand what it means to be more present focused. But one thing I could teach you real quick, and it's something that can really help with your kids is the five, four, three, two, one method. So if you want to teach your child something, if you want to teach them a new behavior, if you want to teach them how to make, you know, how to do something new or how to talk to people, you can't do it when they're upset and you really can't do it when you're upset. So one of the things that, that really helps reset the mind and remind it to where it is and pull it from whatever time zone it's in. Is it 10 years in the future? Is it five years in the past? Wherever it is, how do we bring the brain back to the current moment so we can handle the situation? And so what you do is you just take a deep breath and you can do this with your kids. It's pretty easy. And it turns into a fun activity is you find five things in the room that you can see and then four things you can touch, three things in the room that you can hear, two things in the room you can smell, and one thing in the room you can taste. And what that does is that the brain, when it activates all those senses, it reminds us that sight isn't our only sense. And as somebody who's legally blind, I notice with, with most neurotypical people, they rely on sight the most. They don't hone their hearing. They don't hone their touch. They don't hone their smell, any of that. It's mostly sight. It's what they see. They're looking, looking, looking. But we also live in a society that's very heavily look at your phone, look at the, look at the advertisements. And so we're constantly bombarded by information and we don't realize how stressed out we are just from walk driving down the street. We see hundreds and hundreds of things that just stress us out. So that's a good tip. And like I said, when you're thinking with your kids, remind, remind yourself that do you have a full mind or are you being mindful? Are you in that moment with them? Because if you're not, it's going to be really hard for you to see all the different aspects of what's contributing to what's happening. So, um, Jeremy, can we, can we just talk about that for a second? Because, sure. and, and I, I, I speak for myself, not for anybody else, but I, these theories and they sound good, but when we're dealing with major meltdowns, and um, major calamity, which a lot of our households are dealing with, um, some of this stuff is really, really hard um, when, when you're um, parenting under fire. So can you address some of that with us? So th that's it. I'm glad you brought that up. So here's a, here's a real world example I have. Um, when I was in the schools, we had a new uh, transfer in. He was a three-year-old nonverbal um uh, you know he was autistic and he was violent and nobody told me he was coming i was at the wrong school so eventually they called me and said he's been screaming for three hours he's pulling on people's hair he's been attacking people and so the first thing i thought was it wasn't oh man this is going to be tough the first thing i thought was that brain doesn't feel safe and why doesn't it feel safe and so I drove over there, I went to the school, and I noticed there was four people standing around the child trying to figure out what was wrong. And what that taught me was, and this, this is the hardest thing about dealing with these kinds of behaviors, because I've had a lot of success with them. But the thing is, when the child is in crisis mode, that brain is completely not understanding what's happening, and does not feel safe, and does not feel like they're being protected. And as parents, when we get upset, which I get it, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but it's just something to think about. When you get upset and you get frazzled and you get worried and they look and see you like that, that tells the brain that you are not going to protect them for whatever threat they think is coming or whatever the threat they think is there. And a lot of times these kids, they feed off of our anxiety they can feel our anxiety and so what i did would do what i did with this child was i sat next to him and he was screaming at the top of his lungs and so i put headphones in you know i was like i'm not going to sit and listen to it and so i just put headphones in and i sat and i looked at him at the corner of my eyes but i did what what i it's called the i call it the sentinel so basically i would just look back and forth like i was scanning the area for threats 
And so I just looked back and forth and I could see him out of the corner of my eyes. He was throwing things around, but I just acted calm and I didn't address the behavior. I didn't act. I saw what he was doing. If he started to try to self-harm him, I would redirect him, but without eye contact, without verbal, because I wanted to make sure he was safe, but I also want to make sure he wasn't getting any kind of attention from me. And so what I would do is every time he would stop screaming to take a breath, I would turn and engage and go, oh, hey, how are you? <clears throat> and then when he started to scream again, I would go back to this. And that's the trick is that we are taught from our past parenting that we need to be stern and we need to be strict and we need to be face the problem on and talk to the kid when they're being in crisis mode. But really what we need to do is you go deadpan robot when they're misbehaving. I'm, I'm talking like this. You, you try that, try that with an adult and see how they react to it. They immediately react to it because the thing is attention is attention. If you're showing me attention, I don't care if it's negative or positive. I feel safer because you're paying attention to me. But if my behavior is causing you to disengage, the brain can pick that up and it will. It just takes that amount of, okay, I need to see this objectively. And that's, that's kind of what the next section is too, is that we'll, we'll go through these next sections and then we'll come back to that and how it reflects to those, if that makes sense. But I hear that all the time and I, I totally understand when it's your child and they're, you know, having a meltdown. It's hard to think. It's it, it shuts so, your brain. So basically, you're kind of reiterating, um, like maybe one of the things that we've probably all heard um, is, is basically walk away or disengage, or um, because, like you said, when when they're when their brain's on fire like that, th there's nothing nothing being solved. They're not hearing anything. There's not any reasoning, and so it's um, kind of disengaging to a certain ex extent to ideally bring them back to center and then engage when they're engaging in the appropriate behavior. Yes. And like I said, I'll, let's go over this next parts and then we'll come back to that. Sounds good. Uh, because there's a part in it that directly talks about that. So, but that is a very good question. So just real fast, these are the, the benefits of the present focus parenting. Okay. It, it, it improves the parent-child communication. It can reduce the symptoms of hyperactivity. It Parent satisfaction goes up, lessen aggression, lowers the feelings of depression, lessens stress and anxiety, promotes more parental involvement, and makes uh, parenting feel like less effort. And the hard part is it, it doesn't feel like that at front because you're having to rewire the way that you've been taught how to parent. The hard part is that when I tell parents and I work with parents on this, their first instinct is to blame themselves for not having done it right the first time. And that's not helpful either, because that's, again, that's traveling off into the past. That's setting regret. Like with me, I learned all this stuff after I grew up as a very angry father. And my dad was always an angry father. And I was like, I'm never going to be that. And then I had kids and it hit me. And I was like yelling all the time. I was always frustrated. I was the, I would bring everybody down. You know, we would have, everybody else would be having fun and I'd be in a bad mood. And, and then I went, I, I ended up going back to school because I started working with going to my kid's school for, um, what's it called? The, uh, uh, it was like a, a, a volunteer situation at their school. And I started being around other kids and I started to realize that if I, if it was other people's kids, it didn't bother me. And I was really good with them and they would listen to me. And when it was with my kids, I'd get really frustrated. And so I wanted to know why that was. So that's went back to school. And of course I looked back on, 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 you know, the way I'd been and I felt really bad about it. But at the same time, it lets me empathize with people who f struggle with parenting because it's not easy. And, it, and there's so many different resources out there and there's so many different approaches to it. It's just constantly this search. And then you get into the situation and it feels like it all falls apart. So here's a few different ones. So listening is one of the most important. And again, this one can be tough if your child has problems with verbalization. But if it's that case, if you have a child that's nonverbal, listen to their behavior because behavior is communication, period. 
if they're if they're having a behavior, it means they're they are communicating something with the outside world. And when we just see the behavior, you got to remember if you see your child screaming and losing it, are you really that upset that your child's doing that? Or are you having memories of other people you've seen do that? Are you again traveling out into the past or traveling in the future where you're picturing them having this meltdown in in to in front of their wife or at college or getting arrested for it, you know? And in the present moment, you have to, if they're not self-harming, then they're not misbehaving. If they're not hurting themselves, they're in control. Uh, one of the things, you know, like for instance, let's say your child runs into the wall, which is one of the scariest things for parents. And I've seen it happen a lot. If a child runs in the wall <coughs> with their chest, you shouldn't think, oh my God, my child is trying to hurt myself and hurt themselves. Your first thought should be, oh, wow, they're protecting their head. That means they are in control. They're just confused. Because if they run head first, then they're trying to hurt themselves and you got to address that. But if they're hitting their chest or if they're scratching their arms, they're not trying to cause permanent damage. They're just frustrated. That's, that's their reaction to what anxiety feels like. So really listening to a child, it means giving them your full attention. <clears throat> and again, if the behavior frustrates you, you need to calm yourself. And we'll get to that one too, because listening doesn't always mean verbally too, but children learn how to listen <clears throat> by being listened to, because that's how they learn things. They learn things by watching us. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna grab my water real fast. <clears throat> okay. So that I, I have a question because, um, sure. you know, um, you know, through the years with one of my kids, um, you know, one of the things that we've always done is 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 not engage when when there were meltdowns happening and things like that. Um, and, and so in and, and, and then they up the ante and, and whatever, but not engage. But um, in which I still think was the, is the right thing to do. So when they're when they're acting out like that, I, I do think that that's the right thing. But I do also think that that also um, yields this feeling inside of them that no one ever <laughs> listens to me. Um, so it's like this, it's kind of, it sometimes feels like this game of cat and mouse um, because you're right. When you are acting like that or you're screaming or cussing or doing whatever you're doing, no, we don't listen to you. We don't, we don't engage and we never have. It's not like we did once and then we stopped doing that. We just kind of never have. But that feeling of you don't listen to me, how, how do you address that? How old is the child? The child's grown now or will be grown next month. Um, but, but, you but know, they, even they, from they, when they a start small age, all, a small age, probably as young as five or six years old saying, you don't ever listen to me. I kind of most, you know, kind of even through childhood, you know, and, and adolescence and things like that. And we definitely do. Um, and, and we laugh and because we, we think, wait, you talk incessantly. All we do is listen to you, you know, you know, with ADHD, right? Like we, we all listen to you and listen a, and listen a lot. Um, so we don't feel that way, but it, it's not the perception of, of the child, right? Um, when you don't engage with them in, in those behaviors, they, they definitely feel not listened to. No, I understand that. And with that one too, and like I said, it's not that you want to just ignore the child when they're having a meltdown. It's that you just don't want to give energy to it. So you can say things yeah. like, I noticed that you're upset, but I need to, I need you to calm down before I can talk to you. And then you just, and, and <clears throat> you got to remember too, one of the things that's important is that when you're dealing with a child and you're trying to rewrite or trying to help build a script in their mind, just like a computer. And, you know, this is one of the analogies I use a lot with, with people in general is to not see yourself as a narrative, like a, like a TV show that's all encompassing, but instead to try to see yourself as software that gets released new updates. And when you're building software, you have to use a specific type of programming language. And when you're talking to a child, if you're dealing with something difficult, you 
the same language. And that's the hard part when you have two parents is trying to get them to align on that. If you use the same language all the time, the message gets across more. And one of the examples I saw that working in the schools was I had a, ch- a parent or a, one of my teachers couldn't get this kid to respond to her. And he was just sitting at the desk and he was supposed to do this activity and he just wouldn't do it. And she was like, can you please get started? I, I already asked you to start. Can you start? Hey, I told you to. And so I noticed and I wrote it down every single time she prompted him. It was a different language. It was different words. So to him, it's a completely different prompt. So he wasn't not following orders. It's just he was getting new orders every time. And so using similar language, you can do that. You can address it. Not completely. Just like I said, I notice you're upset. And just that way they know that you noticed it. But you can be in the room with them. <coughs> you just have to let yourself look. Like I said, you have to shut yourself down. You have to look like, I mean, because to a children, everything's a toy, right? And they figure out how to make toys work. And if you give them two action figures, one of them, when you push the button, it dances around and it shouts. And then the other one, when you push the button, the little red nose flashes. They're going to play with the one that does more things. And so if they're using their behavior to elicit a response out of you, <coughs> the, 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 the less of the response, the less that they'll attempt to elicit it from you. But when they think that they haven't been listened to and you have been listening to them, and that's one of the things too, is that were you just listening passively or were you asking questions or repeating what they said? Well, and, and one thing I would say is like, I have always, that is one of the things, and it was actually a, a, a joke. Um, I had an older child and, um, and because I had said these things so many times, one time I heard the child, the other child reciting what I typically say to the younger child. And it said, and the older child said, I'm sorry, you're so mad right now. Um, but maybe you should go to your room and calm down and then we can talk to you when you feel better. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, it's like, you know, whenever your other kid is reciting, you know, reciting some of the things. So it's not that we just ignore and we certainly do say, you know, we, we want to hear how you're feeling. Um, but we want to talk about it. Not let's, let's not scream about it. We say things like that. Um, and, and someone um, shared in the chat, chat box, and thank you for, for sharing. Please feel free to share. This is a private little group here, um, so nobody's hearing all this. Um, someone said, I struggle with how to help my child um, calm down. I mean, um, our, our kids go from zero to 100 in, in, you know, uh, in a second. So can, can we talk about that a little, Jeremy, about, about – maybe not engaging, but actually helping them to calm down um, are, are some good strategies on that? Yeah, one, let me see real fast. So, uh, okay, yeah, so it's, it's in this next slide. Um, so with, with the non-judgmental acceptance, all right, this one, this one takes some time, but this kind of goes into what we were just talking about. The way, you know, <clears throat> it's about, not judging their behavior because sometimes we get personally hurt because they're not acting right and the reason that happens it's totally natural too and it's something that most it it, they should tell you after you had your baby by the way this is really important before you leave the hospital you should know this they have they it's specifically more with mothers but it does happen with fathers too when you hear your biological child cry it increases your blood pressure and they've actually done studies where they had brand new mothers listening to babies crying, trying to figure out which cry was their baby. And they, they didn't know the baby that well yet. It had only been like two or three weeks. <clears throat> so they weren't that good at telling it auditorily, but we could tell their blood pressure would go up when they heard their own baby. So that was something that they realized that, that we're naturally adapted to reacting to that. So that's why it's hard for parents that's another reason is you're, you're immediately, your fight or flight gets kicked in. Immediately you go into damage control because you're like, <clears throat> something's wrong with my baby. I need to help my baby. 
And that's a totally natural thing, but it also, it, it skews our judgment. It takes us away from the, how do we handle this kind of systematically? So that leads us to this one, which is the emotional awareness. So with this one, bringing awareness extends to the parent, uh, to the child and back. Modeling emotional awareness is key to teaching your child the same. So what that means is we focus too much on how we can calm the child down when we really should be showing them how to calm down. I mean, your perfect example is, do you remember when you showed your child how to walk or told your child how to walk? It's just that simple. There's so many behaviors that they pick up, but behavior we think we have to tell them. But really, if the child is upset and it's upsetting you, that is a perfect time to show that brain what to do, which means openly sit by the child and go, and let them see your body calm down. Let them see you employing the skills that you learn to calm down, not telling them to calm down. Because there, no matter how old you are, no matter where you're from, I have yet to meet anybody who likes being told to calm down. And <clears throat> it's something about behavior. We think that we have to take control over it, but we don't show them how to, you know, we, like for instance, eating, we feed them with a spoon a handful of times, <clears throat> excuse me, and then they're reaching for the spoon. We showed them how to do it. With walking, they watch us walk around. With talking, they hear us talking. You know, there's all these things that they're picking up. But when it comes to how to control your emotions, one of the biggest problems is that the average American doesn't know how. So we're technically teaching the child to do something that's beyond what we know how to do. Because one of the reasons we get so frustrated is because we have not been told as a culture how to do anything involving emotion. We're not taught it in schools. We're not taught it in church. We're not taught it in, high, in college. They don't teach us what to do if you have an emotion. Because technically what you're supposed to do when an emotion comes is you accept it and say, oh, I'm having an emotion. And you let it pass. You let it go through you. But we stop it. We hold on to it. Like, no, I don't want that out. I can't let people see emotion because emotion is weakness. I, I, I can't have that in my life. So I'm going to just hold that inside and let it sit there <coughs> until it gets worse. And the emotions start to, to bundle up and get worse. So if your child is having a complete meltdown, then similar to what, what do you do when, you're, when, you're babies, when they're a baby and they're crying? You pick them up and you calm down. And I know you remember this when they were really little. If you were anxious or it was the middle of the night and you were tired, they would feel it. They would not calm down unless you calm down first. And that kind of leads into this area, which is the self-regulation. And of course, we hear this all the time, you know, that you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you can help the child. But I feel like that, that analogy gets overused, but not really ever explained is that what makes emotions and what makes outbursts seem so overwhelming in the moment is because one, it scares us. And when we're scared, we can't think. Two, we are not taught how to regulate our emotions as adults. So we just try to tell the kid to do it, but we don't ever actually show them it because there's three stages to learning. There's explanation, demonstration and trial. And when it comes to emotional regulation with our kids, we stop at explanation. We just tell them what to do. We don't have them test it. We don't have them practice it. We don't discuss it when they're not upset. You know, I mean, <coughs> having some kind of back and forth with your child when they're in a good mood and talking about what to do if they get upset or what their emotions are, or the fact that it's normal, and that there's nothing wrong with them. But a lot of times it's just so peaceful when they're not having an emotional breakdown 
that we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to bring it up. And so there's these long, you know, might be two or three days, they don't have an emotional breakdown. Well, with most kids, it's maybe two or three minutes <laughs> or, you know, five, let's say there's a 10 minute breakdown and there's nothing happening. We tend to do things the opposite of the way they do it in behavioral psychology. <clears throat> you want to give all your attention to the behaviors you like and none of your attention to the behaviors you don't. But given the way we react, we react and the way we've been taught how to parent, we give all of our attention to the bad behavior. And when the kid's being good and quiet, we use that time to be alone. But time and time again, I've seen this work with parents and I always tell them, if you notice they're quiet and they're playing in their room by themselves, go tell them that's what you like. Go intervene, go bug them. Just say, hey, this is great. I love the way you're sitting quietly, playing with your brother, eating your food, but we don't give a lot of attention to the right behaviors because we believe it's what they're expected to do. And that's another part of kind of the failure of training parents in America is that part of our brain believes, well, why should, I hear this all the time, why should I reward them for what they're supposed to do? And it's really important to think, you know, even with this time traveling analogy, that the, the, the ideas of time are made up. You know, it's a, it's a made up concept that we have, but as an adult, we totally accept it. It's the same way with, with the idea behind what people are supposed to do. I mean, they've got to think about this. These kids with autism, you know, we have, we have what's called sensory adaptation. It's where our brain can block out sensory information once we stop listening to it. So like my air conditioner in the background, I, or I no longer feel myself sitting, or I'm not paying attention to the flashing light in the corner because my brain gets used to it and adapts to it. But a lot of kids with autism, they're constantly bombarded by everything that's happening all at the same time. So neurotypical people, it's really hard to understand that because we are able to cut out a lot of what's going on. But because we cut out so much of what's going on, we don't fully understand the, the situation. And most of the time, we're not even in the same situation. That's why being present with a child that has sensory processing stuff is so important. Because if you're in that present moment and you're looking around, maybe you'll figure out it could just be the light that's in the room that's causing it. But they don't have the language to explain to you that they can hear the buzzing light or that the air conditioner is making a weird noise. They just get upset. And it's easy for us to take it personally because we as parents, and I hear this all the time from parents, it's really easy to see an emotional breakdown is a failure on your part, but you got to break away from that. When you see a mental breakdown or a emotional breakdown, don't think, oh my gosh, I'm failing this child. I'm not doing a good job. Take yourself out of the equation and say, why are they upset? What is happening here? How can I help? What do I need to show them? What can they learn from this situation? I don't know if that helped, but... <laughs> Well, Jeremy, um, a couple of things that I wanted to say, and again, um, you know, my, my baby is transitioning into adulthood. So I've done this for a lot of years. And um, one thing that I had to do is I had to check myself, okay? Um, as a parent and a rational mind, I had to remember, you look at your child and they look the part and they might look their age, but with their ADHD brain or autism spectrum disorder and things like that, they're not there. They're not at the same maturity level. They're two to four years behind. So we're saying, oh, oh my goodness, you're 12 years old. Of course, you should know you should brush your teeth every morning or, you know, little things. Of course, you should know you should get dressed when you get out of bed Monday through Friday because you know you have school, well, you know, simple things, right? Um, uh, but I guess, I guess what I'm saying is sometimes I needed to lower my expectations because, because even though I was looking at the child at that said age, that's not where they were from a maturity level. And that was, um, so, so bringing, being fair, being fair with the child, um, and not having unrealistic expectations where your child is destined to fail, you know, because you have these unrealistic unre expectations. That was one thing. But the other thing that I wanted to say um, really did help, and, and Jeremy, you mentioned this too, um, was DBT therapy, dialectical behavior therapy. They really talk about skill, skills and regulation, and they give real 
ideas. But the thing is, is you don't have to pay millions of dollars. You can go, you know, you can do DBT therapy if you want to. They have a lot of online things now. But a lot of the skills are skills that we know. Cooling down skills. Take a walk. Wash your face. Eat a snack. Do a little art project. Call a friend. I mean, there, there's a lot of different small things um, and, but this is what Jeremy hit on the head. And this is what started working in our house, um, was at a time where the child is calm and they're not having a meltdown saying, you know, one of the things as, as a parent that I've done, um, I've made a list of things that when I get really angry, uh, these are, these are things that I can do to calm down because, you know, the world is just not, they don't appreciate big meltdowns and, and we've got to. I've, even as an adult, I've got to manage these. So I was thinking that me and you could put a list together, not of what I want, but of things that you're comfortable with that would be a good idea, something that you would like, that you would think would be helpful in calming you down. And let's make this list. And we actually did make that list. And it, it was, you know, from her perspective, not mine, not dictated. And, um, and so instead of saying that, you know, what you said, calm down, and that makes everybody, everybody bad, um, we could say, um, let's, let's use one of your skills. Um, you know, let's, let's think about this. Would you like to take a walk? Or instead of saying, let's use a skill, just pull one of those sk skills off the paper and, and, and kind of plant that idea. And, and that, actually did help. So I think the list is good. Um, it, it's a good, it's a good talking piece for sure. It's funny because it, that leads into this, the, the, the last slide, the compassion one, because it's <clears throat> in this quote here, it says it's, um, when none of us are perfect, we stop holding our children to higher expectations of perfection than we can achieve ourselves. <clears throat> and it's true. Cause like we want our children to do better than us. We we want them to have an easier time. We want them to to get things quicker. And when we're thinking about the future for our child, we don't think about all the hardships we went through. And it's a tough thing. I've had to talk to a lot of parents about this is that you have to let you have to realize that your child's going to have to go through suffering, you know, and and they're going to have to go through hardships because it's how we learn as people. You know, there's nobody's had a life yet where it was just easy and everything came to them. And when we realize, when we see a child having an, an outburst and we have two choices, we can one think, Oh man, this is so rough. This is, you know, I wish they weren't doing this. I wish I was a better parent or we could switch to number two and be like, this is natural. This is a natural thing. This is emotions coming through a child who does not fully understand their emotions. And <clears throat> one thing that's really important is that understanding what stress is, because all it is, is the brain got tricked into thinking it's in danger. That's it. And if you look calm and collected, it will remind the brain that it's safe. But if you are frazzled and upset and worried about how it reflects on you and how it affects you and how they, they could have a bad future because of it, then the brain continues to be scared. You have to find a way to make them feel safe. And that's why talking to them about it outside of the situation helps because then they, they can reflect back on a time where they encoded it in a better situation. But the thing is, getting them to calm down is not ever going to work. But if everybody else in the room calms down, they will calm down. I've seen it at residential treatment facilities. I've worked with some pretty rough behaviors in the past. Um, one of the one of the ones I've, I I saw, I did a, a eight day social skills training um, uh, with these kids, and because I was always I was did really good with behavior, they gave me all the kids that were the hardest because they were like Jeremy, we just these were kids that don't technically fit this program, but their parents were going to sue, so we put them in this program anyway. But we gave them all to you, and I was like, okay. So I had all the worst behaviors, but I saw it as a challenge. It was fun. And <clears throat> this one little girl, I'll never forget. I've never seen somebody switch emotions so quickly. Um, and the first time I saw it, she was in the classroom and she had a hula hoop and she was really good at it. She could hula hoop for a long time. And she was like, I was like, you did really good. Great job. And she said, I did. 
and she jumped in the air and yelled, I did it. And then before she hit the ground, screamed, I can't, and started hitting her head on the ground. And I, it, it totally caught me off guard because she was completely fine up until that moment. And she went right into self-harm and is very impulsive. <clears throat> so my first instinct was I just sat next to her and I said, wow, you are calming down so well. And she stopped. And it, I think it caught her off guard that I said that. And she looked at me and she said, I am? I was like, yeah, you calmed down really fast. What do you want to do next? And never, you know, basically with that is never underestimate the power of distraction too. Because drawing your attention to things, right? When a child's acting out, a lot of times it is for attention. So drawing their attention to something else away from themselves can help as well. And so sometimes you can say stuff like that and just say, wow, you calmed down really good. Or say, I like how you didn't throw something this time. You know, looking at what they're doing right instead of focusing on the fact that they're having a meltdown can be huge because then you'll be able to see the incremental steps. Because if you just see a meltdown as a meltdown as a meltdown, you don't notice that the first meltdown, they, they kicked the TV and the second meltdown, they threw their drink and the third meltdown, they just screamed. You're like, wow, I'd take screaming over a broken TV and milk everywhere. So that's actually progress. It's not 100% progress, but progress sometimes is hard to notice when we're just, again, reflecting on the past. And your brain does that. It sees a meltdown and it goes, oh, this is just like that last one. This is just like that last one. But it might not be because our, the, the, the past affects what we see now. Because <clears throat> everything that we he see, hear, feel, touch, all that stuff goes through memory first. So when we're experiencing a meltdown and we're not paying attention to what's actually happening, sometimes we think it's the meltdown from last Tuesday where they ended up in the hospital, but it's not, it's, it may not nearly as bad as that, but all those emotional memories are coming back for you. So that's why it helps to pull yourself into the moment and say, look, I need to watch what's happening. I need to look at the child and see what they're doing exactly. So I can react instead of worrying about whether or not I'm doing a good job. And that's where the compassion comes in, is that this is just, it's just something that they're going through. It's just a situation, but they'll, they'll make it through it. So um, one thing that I just wanted to share with families, um, you know, I, I imagine that we have folks with all different ages along, along the line that you got younger, younger kids, um, are kind of moving into adolescence and things like that. So if you're having some struggles with younger kids, I, I do encourage getting help and getting the interventions that you need um, a, a, as soon as you can. And and granted, you know, our the world that we live in with psychology and psychiatry is tough because, you know, many of the great, you know, the great doctors that you want to see are not in network with your insurance and you're looking at 150 to $200 an hour per session. And, and those add up in time when you need a, a lot. Um, but there is something in the state of Texas called the yes waiver, and there is no waiting list on this. Um, and it is a wraparound program. Uh, it, it's been pretty good. Um, um, we went through that. Um, we, um, we know a lot of families that have gone through it. And it's been pretty good. And it is, um, so it is a wraparound program for your child. And they help on a lot of these skills. Um, they, you know, they, help, they help work on what's broken. And it usually lasts about a year. Um, but you can check that out through your local authority. You can reach out to me directly and I can kind of put you in contact with that. But if you're not familiar with the yes waiver, uh, look up the yes waiver um, um, and, and kind of learn a little bit more about that and check, check into this because that may be a service um, that could be helpful to your family. And this is regardless, most of the families we serve have insurance and things like that. Um, this is, this is covered through the waiver program and it's not an out of pocket expense to the family. So there are some supports, um, that way. Yeah, that's a really good program. And, you know, having a professional help as well gets you that kind of kickstart. But like the, the purpose of this is really to make you to 
think about your mindset behind it. Because if you see your parenting as a systematic approach, like I said, I, I, I parented my kids up to about 10 without it. And then after 10 with it, and it made a huge difference. I've got, now they're all teenagers and I have a great relationship with them because I've employed a lot of these and they had some behavioral issues when they were younger. And I just stopped seeing it like, okay, well, how do we handle this? And a lot of it was just not implying a lot of importance to the actual problem that was happening and just seeing it as just, oh, just something that happens. And that made them not put it at the top and, and it made them not prioritize it as well. So yeah, that, that takes us to the end. I thought this, this is a nice little quote that I put on here, but the, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, of, of good benefits just all around about pulling yourself into the current moment because there, it's, it's, it's too easy for us to drift off. And if you see a lot of, you know, you can see parents or people at work or just people in general are, are kind of feel like they're being pulled apart <laughs> is the way that people describe it. And pulling yourself back to the current moment and realizing that in this moment, you can handle things. And also remembering how much stuff you've handled up to this point too. Because sometimes we get become um, problem focused instead of solution focused. We don't remember what we've done in the past that helped, so. Um, um, so Jeremy, um, how, um, can, people can contact you. You've got your contact information on here. Um, and on the next slide, we've got our contact information. Um, uh, ADDA SR is something that you can join. It's never a requirement to, um, join the mothership. Um, it's $40 a year. It's never a requirement to, um, participate in these webinars where we're, we're glad you're here no matter what, but if you do join the mothership, of ADDASR. There are a ton of resources, a ton of webinars. They have a national, um, a state conference. They have national conferences. There's all kinds of um, great information out there. But um, from one parent to another, I would just like to say that you're not alone. And I know that there's been many times as a parent that I have felt pretty exhausted and pretty out of um, out of ideas and, and frustrated and, and everything. And so certainly you guys are not alone there. Um, we're here to support. Uh, again, we have webinars each month um, on specific topics to help you in your journey. So we're glad that you spent the last hour with us. Uh, Jeremy, we're glad that you um, joined us again. And, and, and if nothing else, Jeremy, I think you brought us back to center because sometimes we get out there in left field because it's so tough. You know, we're in the trenches and then we're out there in left field and we're not even delivering what we want to deliver. But I think this message was a good message in helping us to get back to center and, and being the parents that we want to be. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Hope you'll join us again. And um, we, uh, we, we look forward to, to serving you in this community. Take care, Jeremy. Thank you guys.